This is the second part of our wetlands lecture series. Um, so if you haven't watched part one yet, go watch part one. So we have talked about what um, groundwater is, where the water table is, and how those two things relate to where and how wetlands form. The next thing we're going to talk about is ecosystem services provided by wetlands. Big concepts wise, um, here we're looking at this disproportionate amount of ecosystem services that wetlands provide. So remember, ecosystem services, you're thinking, what are um, things that a functioning ecosystem can do that we can then quantify for use by humans? Things like water purification, um, food provisioning. So how many apples does this orchard produce and um, how much can I sell them for? So that's an ecosystem service. So wetlands globally um, provide a disproportionate amount of ecosystem services. So um, thinking disproportionate like we talked about keystone species, how they're small in number, so here it would be small in area, um, but provide a large amount of the total services. If you um, need a little bit of a refresher on what ecosystem services are, I'd highly recommend going to this website. Um, it breaks them down into those four categories that we talked about um, and gives examples of each one. So it's a, a good place to go visit if you've forgotten. So wetlands cover about 9% um, of the total land area um, of the globe but they provide over 40% of annual renewable services. So this is from a 2005 paper. Um, measurements on this might have changed. Who does the quantifying and how they quantify it is highly um, variable, right? We have to think about globally, how many wetlands do we have? How much area is that? Um, depending on how you're gonna define a wetland using those three characteristics, do all three have to be present or just one? Um, and then how you're quantifying those resources. So super variable, but if you think about that 9% to 40% difference, it's definitely disproportionate no matter how it shakes out. So what are some of these services? Water filtration and purification is huge. We saw that in play um, both at the Arcata Marsh and at the Eureka Wastewater Treatment Facility. Um, we didn't see wetlands playing a part in the treatment at the Eureka plant, but we saw it on the outside of the plant when we went on that little walk outside on the Hikshari Trail. So here's a little diagram of how wetlands work. Um, wetlands tend to be located in these lower areas where water is going to flow by gravity and go to, right, because they form um, where the water table comes above the surface. So that's going to be in the lowest spots. So here we see water traveling across this terrestrial surface, coming downward, picking up contaminants um, as it travels. Oh, touching my face. Ah. Um, as it travels across the surface and then um, it makes it to the wetland. So in that wetland, you have cattails. Um, their roots are dangling into the water. You have water lilies. Those roots are going to help slow the flow of the water. So as the water comes through, it slows and any um, like solid particulates in there can then settle out. So that's part one is settling out that sedimentation that would be clouding up the water. The other thing is that the plants and importantly, the microbes in this ecosystem are going to be absorbing a lot of the nutrients that would be dissolved in that water. So these are things that um, could be considered contaminants. Um, and so a lot of those can be taken up by microbes and changed into something that maybe isn't bioactive. So another organism wouldn't be able to take it up um, or maybe it'll change it into a form um, that is no longer a problem for other organisms. Um, another thing that might happen is that those plants that are in that wetland are going to take up nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus um, that normally if they were to make it out to the ocean or to some other body of water would cause eutrophication. Okay, so this is looking a little bit about then microbes. Um, we used to do a field trip to the Arcata Marsh where um, we talked a lot more about the role of microbes in the water um, purification process. So we don't go into that that much in our class anymore because it's pretty complex, uh, but microbes play a huge role, particularly in um, the changing forms of nitrogen. So removal of nitrogen from the water, either into a form that plants can uptake or into atmospheric nitrogen. Um, so they do a great job of um, taking things that would normally cause eutrophication out in the ocean and turning them into um, something that either the plants in the wetland are gonna use or something that um, isn't gonna make it out to the ocean. 
So other services, limiting coastal erosion and mitigating extreme weather and sea level rise, these two go together. Um, a lot of our wetlands here are coastal wetlands. Um, and so thinking about how those are located on the coast, where as sea level rises, that means that water's coming further inland. Um, so if you have a wetland buffer, those wetlands can absorb a lot of that incoming water. So that'll prevent flooding. The other thing that they can do is um, as they absorb that excess water that comes in, they also help settle out the sediment in that water. So any um, uh, like terrestrial sediment that's coming down stops in the wetland and any kind of coastal erosion that might be happening gets a chance to settle out in the wetland. So they um, do what's called accreting. They accrete a lot of excess sediment and they tend to do it at a rate that matches the rate of sea level rise. So your wetlands sort of build a taller even buffer, not so much just wide and able to absorb water, but tall to keep that water from moving inland and from eroding um, other coastlines that wouldn't be used to that uh, water inundation. Okay, so here is a really cool thing um, that you can use to both increase the amount of wetlands available and to remediate different water sources. Um, so I'm going to post a link to a podcast that my friend Kyle recently made um, with his friend Sean um, about these particular types of um, artificial wetlands. But there are these little floating wetland islands, and you can construct these out of a lot of different materials. You can use things that will biodegrade over time. You can um, you know, use old plastic bottles um, to make your float, um, and then you can inoculate those with um, pleurotus or um, some other mushroom that's going to break down that plastic over time. Um, so many cool options for what you can do and not saying that pleurotus this oyster mushroom is going to break down the plastics but it'll break down other contaminants in the water and then you can in inoculate it with other stuff that will break down the plastic anyway um so these islands um, you would just um, make your float and then you plant all your plants in it and then you put it into a water source where you're either trying to slow the flow of water from one side to the other so kind of create a, a wetland barrier or you can put it in an area where you are trying to um, purify that water. So in both cases, these plant roots are going to serve to slow the flow of water and trap nutrients and either settle out any sediment um, and absorb any contaminants. So that is really cool in their ability to um, purify those water systems. And also as you're doing that, you're creating these islands of habitat for um, a kind of critically endangered type of habitat because as we'll see later um, we have removed a large amount of wetlands so according to the epa an acre of wetlands can absorb up to 1.5 million gallons of water so this is its sort of function as this giant coastal um, sponge or even somewhere inland um, if you have a functional wetland system, um, but you have maybe hurricanes that move through or large storms, they can absorb a lot of that excess storm water. So if we do start seeing more extreme weather events as climate changes, um, wetlands can help defend against those by absorbing a lot of that excess water. Okay, carbon sequestration. This is something we talked about a little bit when we talked about forests. Um, wetlands are another huge source of carbon sequestration. They don't have these massive woody trunks that they're storing the carbon in, um, but they store them in plant tissues that then fall into the water. And because it's an aquatic system, that's low oxygen. And so a lot of those plant tissues can then build up and build up and you get this long-term carbon storage um, because the breakdown of those materials can be slowed. This is particularly important in um, areas in the northern hemisphere where you get these huge bogs of peat moss, um, sphagnum, which creates this very acidic environment. Um, so you get these really acidic bogs. They're wet and they're cold. So those three things together, acidic, wet, so low oxygen and cold to freezing, slow breakdown of that carbon so much so that you get um, almost indefinite storage until that area warms up um, and then you can get the breakdown of those materials and so our northern latitude um, peat bogs are actually really important source of carbon sequestration and that carbon's being released because people will go um, 
dig up that peat and use it as a source for burning because it's such high carbon content. Um, and also because as we get our um, climate change globally, that change is warming extremely in the northern parts of our um, northern hemisphere. So all around the North Pole, we're getting the most extreme warming, and that's causing those peat bogs to warm. Um, and then we are getting breakdown of that carbon, but because it's still wet, it's anaerobic, and we get a lot of methane release. So um, interesting carbon dynamics uh, with wetlands. Here's an infographic I found um, just to kind of get used to looking at what infographics look like. Um, this one is about carbon sequestration by wetlands. Um, there's a lot of different pushes for how we're trying to take carbon out of the atmosphere to slow global climate change. And part of that process has um, been this sort of color labeling of different types of carbon sequestration. So blue carbon is the storage or sequestration of carbon uh, by wetlands. So thinking about, um, you know, if you're a company that wants to offset your carbon output, then maybe you need to um, restore or build a certain amount of functional wetland space. And so that's maybe some kind of uh, commodity that's going to be more freely traded on the market soon. Um, but thinking about just how important these coastal wetlands are particularly to our carbon sequestration. Okay, now here's a bunch all in a row. Um, habitat, um, especially if we think about where we live here with all of our coastal wetlands, um, we are in the Pacific Flyway. Um, so birds are migrating thousands of miles up and down the coast and they need spots to stop and to get food and have um, a safe place to sleep overnight. Um, so our coastal wetland habitats are essential for providing those migratory birds a food source as they move. Um, fish nurseries, again, we have um, either just our coastal fish populations that are going to provide food for people, food for other animals. Um, they need a safe place to have their babies, and coastal wetlands are a really important part of that habitat. Thinking about food, um, a lot of food is harvested from coastal wetlands. Um, and if not, you know, that's not maybe the place where the adults are harvested, that's where the young would have grown up. Um, so a really important food source um, globally for people and for other animals. And recreation. Unfortunately, we did not get to go to all of the wetlands that we planned to, but we did get to visit a few. So we went to the coastal dunes a few times, um, and we also went to the Arcata Marsh. And at all those places, we saw other people out recreating. Um, so especially here, it's a really important source of um, just this sort of cultural well-being for us to be able to get out into. <laughs> 